Coming up on this week's show, the Game Awards nominations are out for the industry's best of the year. Sony partner with NCSoft to bring us a Horizon MMO and legendary voice actor Kevin Conroy passes away. Hello friends and welcome to the Weekend Catch-Up Club podcast, the coffee morning show brought to you every week where friends hang out and chat about some of the latest stories going on in the industry. You can follow the show on all your favourite podcasting platforms or watch the video version over on youtube.com slash gamertagged. This is episode 86 and joining me as always is the man with the personality of a can of orange tango, it's the king of the tangent, Mr. James McClellan with his Hugh Hefner loungewear on today. Yeah. I'm sick. I'm <laughs> You're dying. sick. This is the end. <laughs> oh, bless. Well, hurry up. Just keep it together for, for the next 90 minutes, and then you can pop off after that, okay? Yeah, I've had one of those, like, uh, you know, the action films where they go, this will hold you for a while, but uh, I've had one of those <laughs> shots. I'd love to know what's in them, because I would imagine that the medical community would probably have a use for them, but... Yeah, apparently we've not got that technology yet. So. <laughs> <laughs> and joining us in the co-host hot seat is none other than the voice from beyond. You've heard her in Roller Drome and Goat Simulator 3, which is now out. <laughs> it's the ethereal, the spooky, the immensely talented Sarah Lynam. Bah, hello. It's me. That's so good. That's so good. <laughs> Go Simulator 3 is out, Sarah. We can now finally say that it is out. And you are... Are you a goat in this game? You have acted in it. I... So tell us... Give us everything about Go Simulator 3. Come on. You're on the down low. Um, yeah, so I am not a goat in it, but I am certain that I will have been yeeted by uh, whoever's playing the goat, like, within the world. Um, I actually got to be involved in this game because I met the guy who was designing all the sound for it through another project, um, which has completely slipped my mind. I will quickly look that up. Um, but they moved to Coffee Stain North after being on this previous project and said, would you like to be involved in this, uh, we cannot tell you what it is project. And then I got all the lines through and it was like, oh, what a goat and i was like okay what is this what is this game and connor was like oh, it's goat simulator so the thing with nda like i i i was talking about it and connor was like oh um i could probably figure that out but you, you technically have broken your nda by telling me <laughs> <laughs> i was like oh no i'm pretty sure there's like a there must be a level of if you live with someone and you're recording in the same place yeah. he's gonna hear me like screaming yeah. random shit in this booth anyway and be able to yeah. figure it out um but yes, I think that's so, allowed, though, right? But if it's, I, I if it's think friends, so. friends and family is kind of allowed. Well, maybe not friends, but family, uh, it, same same domicile, same, is, is same household. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, and if not, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I got to do some absolutely mad lines. There were like um six different documents that were sent through of all the NPC lines, um that vary from like just like a casual hello or hey or look it's a goat to at one point they asked specifically for an owen wilson style wow so i'm sat there Brilliant. like next to the microphone going wow wow that's amazing <laughs> I, just, I love this amazing that's so, that's so silly um there were some there are some really great things and i think there are also moments in the game where there must be ghosts or something because it and uh, one of the lines was mm. go get that ghost goat and it so so random um but so much fun and i was <laughs> it was all done remotely as well because they're a company based in sweden right. um and so i was here in in my booth on my own one crazy afternoon just recording all these things <laughs> and um oh yeah the other thing i got me to do is there was a whole section in um in swedish and they said oh um we know that Swedish isn't a language that you speak, but could you just give them a go? Because we'll a we'll find it really funny, and b we okay. might put your your terrible Swedish into the game. And I was like, Amazing. oh my god, okay. <laughs> I kind of hope not, but also if it sounds stupid enough, maybe they will. Um, the only yeah. Swedish I know is the is the chef from the Muppets. That's it. <laughs> That's the the only Swedish I which can. Is, which is totally legit and yeah, uh, absolutely how it should be. Yeah. <laughs> I read somewhere that the, the Swedish chef in the Muppets is apparently very beloved. I don't know if this is true, but is very beloved in Sweden. 
but well, because there he's called, and I, and this, I, this has to be wrong. I must have made this up or had a fever dream, but because over there he's something like the Finnish chef, and they're like, ha, 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 they are mocking Finland. <laughs> <laughs> Honest to God, I read that somewhere, and I was like, I don't think that's true. I desperately want that to be true. But did you that have to hilarious. do any just like screams and oh my gods and stuff? Because yes. I swear, and this could just be me hoping against hope and you know being a big fan of your work, that I watched the trailer and it, the very first moment that someone gets yeeted by the goat, I was started thinking, I think that's Sarah smashing into the side of a skyscraper. It sounded like <laughs> I could be completely wrong, but it sounded like oh, it. Like, yeah. I'm gonna have to re-listen. But yeah, absolutely. There was like a series of just screams, and it was like scream as if like something's just hit you. So it's kind of like a ah, um, or scream as if you're flying across like a long, like a, a really long distance. And I was like, okay, amazing. So there would there would be moments where I was screaming for a good like five or six seconds. Um, so it could be. I'm gonna listen to the trailer again and be like, maybe that is me. That I could have sworn that was on the trailer, <laughs> but amazing. Yeah, that's, that's but, an awesome job. Oh, <laughs> it's it's so cool. It was so, good. so cool. It was really fun, and they were really lovely as well. Um, and I'm, uh, I have the privilege of getting to meet them next week. Um, I'm going to Sweden for the launch party, so that'll be super Yay! cool. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, so I'll I'll ask them about the Swedish chef thing or the Finnish chef thing and see what they say. Yeah. Please, I would God. love to know. I will. I will. <laughs> Sarah, you will always be the goat to us, no matter what. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So today's topics, everybody, we have a, a lot to talk about. Um, we obviously have just talked a little bit about Goat Simulator 3 there, um, which is now, out, I believe, on pretty much every single platform. Mm -hmm. We have, obviously, the very sad news about legendary voice actor Kevin Conroy to talk a little bit about. We have lots of NC Soft news. NC Soft are an MMO developer in South Korea. We've got some exciting and super interesting news to talk about there. We have a new game called The Perceiver, which got a trailer which looked absolutely spectacular. We got a little bit of news, but a bit thin on the ground this week about the Witcher 3 next gen update. Finally, we're going to be getting some news about that. And. Of course, the big topic, which we'll save for probably the end of the show, is the Game Awards nominations have rolled out. So I'm sure each of us have some thoughts and opinions on that. There's a lot of categories, so we may not cover every single category, but I would imagine we'd want to talk about maybe like some of the big hitter categories as well. But first off, let's just say a little bit of a, a little few words about legendary voice actor Kevin Conroy. This was a huge shock when I opened up the news in the morning and Twitter pages and stuff like that and found out that the legendary voice actor from Batman the Animated Series, um, the Arkham games, the man is Batman. There is no other voice talent that compares to Kevin Conroy for that character. And it was such... Oh, it was so such a shock to hear that the man had passed away. Apparently it was due to um, an illness with um, with which later turned out to be um, related to cancer. Um, very kind of, I guess, sudden. Seemed like it was sudden, but what what a voice talent. And of course, for Sarah, being a, being a voice actor as well, I'd imagine this hit, hit you extra kind of hard as well, but I'd love to just hear hear both of your thoughts on the man's work and um, about, about this news. Yeah, it's it's really sad, really really upsetting news. And I think um, one, uh, I guess, silver lining is that um, he has such a legacy that he's left behind, and we will and we have that like forever. Basically, it means that he's he's left his his footprint um, on the world, and people who maybe didn't know who he was can still experience his amazing talent. Can you know watch. Uh, old school Batman can play the games. I'm actually, this is bad. I've never played any of the Batman games. Atrocious. I'll fix that. Um, but yeah, the animated series it, it was so good, and I that alone made me sad to find out that he'd passed away. Uh, yeah, but anyone with that level, like who's that prolific, it's it's always going to be a big hit to not just the voiceover community, but anyone who's grown up with them uh 
as an actor um, or, 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 or played the games, like, it's just, yeah, it's, it's really sad. I, I don't really, it's hard to know what to say because it's just, it just yeah. feels sad, right? Definitely. And there's, there's not many voice actors that are so synonymous with a particular role hmm. that it's that it's that conversation of Iron Man is Robert Downey Jr. Robert Downey Jr. is Iron Man. Like mm-hmm. Batman is Kevin Conroy. The Joker is Mark Hamill. Mm-hmm. There's and you know Peter Cullen is Optimus Prime from Transformers. There's key actors and roles that are just so intimately connected and. Anybody else that wants to take up the mantle of doing voice actors for that are forever compared to always those yeah. you know those titans um, that are, that establish those characters and they're like the de facto iteration of those characters. Mm-hmm. And Kevin Conroy was absolutely you know Batman, Bruce Wayne, uh, Jamie. It, it's it is it's just a a massive loss to the the uh well the world in general but to the, the the geek world particularly like the guy was as you say he was batman it's it's weird like obviously batman actors in films come and go and there's always the comparisons between the two and it's always like well affleck's not as good as bale and bale's not as good as keaton and then but everyone kind of universally seems to agree that kevin conroy is batman like it's never really been in question they always wanted wanted him back for any new animated project and um he also like a little bit of a, uh, a geeky thing for me was uh, I'm a huge Kevin Smith fan, and he got to he got Kevin Conroy in to the uh, Jay and Silent Bob reboot movie in a brief part because it was like he wanted to get as many Batman as he could into the film. So he had Val Kilmer and he had Ben Affleck, oh, amazing, and he had Kevin Conroy because he said that guy is the voice of Batman. He said as much as I love mm. the other guys in. The, the live action roles, this is Batman. So yeah, knowing that, you know, the next animated outing that we get or game outing we get, it's going to be someone else is gonna it's gonna be a, a a hard pill to swallow for quite a while. And it is just very, very sad and obviously, you know, more so for those um close to him. But yeah, no, it's it's yeah. bloody awful. So I know, I know. So anyway just wanted to do a little bit of a segment there as a, as a little bit of a tribute to to Kevin Conroy before we move on to uh, some of the other topics, which are, um, let's talk about NC Soft News because they've got two kind of really big, big news articles, which I was really quite stunned about. Um, the first one is a, apparently they've, they've struck a deal with Sony and this is hugely exciting. If you're a Horizon Zero Dawn fan, Horizon Forbidden West fan, this is actually freaking awesome news if it does actually transpire to be a horizon themed mmo now if anybody who doesn't know nc soft are obviously the developers behind guild wars mmo and lineage lineage i'm not aware of i'm kind of familiar of the brand of guild wars and guild wars 2 um but they seem to be extremely well established in the mmo rpg space so the fact that sony are tapping them to create a project, develop a project for Horizon is hugely exciting. And I'd love to get both of your thoughts on the potential for this as well, because playing if you play through any of the games, it was always really rich in its potential for a multiplayer side or a monster hunter style of game where the two of you just team up and you hunt down these ginormous robot dinosaur creatures. And maybe it was just that. But obviously an MMO kind of blows the doors open to, you know, creating your character in one of the other factions of which there are many throughout this this universe that Guerrilla Games have now established. There's lots of creatures. There's lots of potential uh, in this in this world. So I think, Sarah, you're, you're an Aloy fan and a Horizon Zero Dawn fan, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, played through all of the first one and it's so, so good. And I played through the second one. I haven't finished it yet unfortunately because other games have gotten in the way <laughs> it is this horrible habit of starting things and not finishing them not so not so with god of war i will definitely be finishing that um but i will come back to it um i think in terms of like um mmo rpgs i actually haven't played any since 
this is showing my age now, the 90s when I played Ultima online. That was what I used to play. Uh, yeah. Um, and I loved it. I really loved the sort of community aspect of it. And um, I played a little bit of World of Warcraft, but yeah, Ultima was my main one that I played. Um, but like, it's, I, I think the world totally lends itself to it. And I, I also think that what I, they were going to do multiplayer in the original game and then maybe in the yeah. second game, but then decided, no, 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 let's just focus on building this, um, you know, the single player game and make it a, a separate thing that we do, whether or not it was going to be a horizon or not. Didn't know, but that's cool that it will be horizon. I would love it to be a monster hunter style thing because some of those big beasties would be really fun to take down with, with friends. Um, yeah. And if they sort of, you know, built on the existing uh, creatures, that are in the world already and made them even bigger, even grander. And then you had to yeah, take them down. Um, I also love the idea of like, um, yeah, having quests within the world to conquer with, with a bunch of friends um, and it not being limited to, you know, one or two uh, in a sort of classic uh, multiplayer being MMO RPG. Maybe you could have like a full guild of like, like a decent like collection of people. That'd be super cool. Yeah. I'd be so really, down for that. It really does get the ideas sparking and the cogs turning as to what they could do in an MMO space. Because if you've played any of the games, you'll be familiar with the um like the the the, the caverns kind of thing, which yeah, are where yeah. the the uh the dinosaurs or the dinosaurs, the, the robots are created. So you can imagine if they were to blow that out and make those raids or something like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Where a thunder jaw is being created, and then you have to do this massive raid with eight different hunters of different factions coming together to, I don't know, whatever the objective might be. But that could be absolutely epic, you know, completely epic. Because some of these dinosaurs are huge, thunder jaw being the biggest. But in uh, Forbidden West, there's like the the woolly mammoth type of of robot um, creatures. There there's big there's flying ones, obviously. There, I mean, Jamie, you're a World of Warcraft guy. Can you imagine a ter a robot pterodactyl mount that you could fly through this post apocalyptic rebirthing environment world that is now taken over <sighs> by robots, and you get to control the robots? And the potential is huge. And I'm not a big MMO guy at all. I played, I've dabbled in a couple. I quite liked a little bit of World of Warcraft. I quite liked a little bit of Final Fantasy, but I never stick with them. I always play them for a few hours. I'm like, this is cool, but I'm not going to fall down a rabbit mm -hmm. hole of consuming hundreds of hours because, as Sarah mentioned there, there's too many amazing games that I want to <laughs> just play, and they're typically single-player mm -hmm. games, occasionally multiplayer games, and I never I never stick with it with MMOs at all, but I know Jamie's hardcore MMO guy for, for Warcraft and some others. So, Jamie, are oh. you excited about the potential of a horizon. I really am. Um, I, I'm weirdly excited for someone who has both never played Horizon and never played Guild Wars Two. Um, <laughs> but I was, uh, I was, I was lucky enough to work a little bit with the guys from NCSoft in the past because they were the sponsors for a lot of our uh, Eurogamer events. I still want my fucking toaster, Alan. Um, <laughs> there's the ongoing saga of Al has a Guild Wars 2 toaster in his attic that is mine and I haven't got it yet so they made toasters as a branded <laughs> giveaway item that we yeah. toasted the logo yeah. into the fucking amazing that is cool. they have such <laughs> pedigree when it comes to MMOs like it was, the only reason I never got into Guild Wars 2 was I, came, I felt like I came along too late at the time to really dive into it. Everyone I knew who played it was already max level, doing high level raids, right. and I would have been left in the dust. And I was yep. already deep into Warcraft by this point. So uh, I thought, well, I'm going to have to pick one. Because MMOs are time sinks. You know, I have yeah. hundreds, mm -hmm. if not thousands of hours at this point in World of Warcraft. I played Ultimate Online, like, and I mean religiously, like to the point <laughs> that I had an MSN contact list of uh, buyers, and I was uh, the the name that I actually got given was not particularly kind, uh, and I'm not going to use it. But I was essentially the guy who got you. I was like the forty quid Bob. Like if you needed something in Ultima, you got hold of me because I'd get it for you for forty quid. And I used to, and I ran this brilliant little side business. I love it. I love MMOs and the community element, and it carries on into other games. At the moment, I'm heavily into Minecraft. And we have a realm going, and there's 10 of us running it. And everyone's got their projects, and we're building 
we've built a keep and a village and we've got we're working on a city now in a far flung corner of the map but we've got underground tunnel systems and the world goes on and everyone's helping each other out so you take that 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 sense of community and fun and then you throw in the little i know about the horizon lore with these massive robotic dinosaurs wandering about and the possibility of taking them down with a group of friends and how pretty the game is as well like the idea of that on a vast scale you know just yeah i'll it's definitely something if it comes to pass i will be in like there's no doubt in my mind that i will at the very least yeah. give it a go um so yeah yeah sign me up it looks that 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 will do me that sounds pretty damn good i know I, I just like the idea of being able to pick up, pick one of the factions, whether you're the Nora or the Karja or the yes. Shadow Karja or one of the other ones, that you get to just kind of build your character from the very ground up. Like these are the traits that are um, the epitome of or the tenets of this particular tribe. And then you build your character and then you get to meet up with your friends or maybe in other tribes, other, other parts of the world, and then go hunt together. Monster Hunter style, MMO style, and... It's hugely exciting to get more MMO games on console. I'm mm. assuming this project will come to console. I'm not. Mm. I, I'm, I mean, I might be a bit ignorant and thinking that it is coming to console. It might just. It might be a PC only venture. I doubt it. Being being a Sony partnership and with yeah, a, that yeah. that IP, but I hope it does because MMO is on console. There's not many. Final Fantasy 14 is. I'm assuming by far the biggest. It's hugely successful. Yeah. That's obviously on PC as well and, and cross-play and everything like that. I would imagine this would be PC and probably PlayStation. Um, maybe one of the listener viewers can let me know if Final Fantasy XIV is, is on Xbox. I don't think it is. I think it's I think it's locked to PlayStation and PC, but I need to maybe kind of confirm that. So I'm assuming that Horizon would probably follow a similar route where get it on your PlayStation because it is, it is a first-party IP, and but you're so coming to PC as well to capture that fan base and that MMO hungry um, demographic uh, and player base mm. to really booster and bolster it and boost it and uh, have just a great time and get them to champion it as well because mm -hmm. the, the learnings and potential from NC Soft with this particular franchise again is huge and I think we're we're all three of us are kind of excited for it even though. Two of us out of the three of us are not really MMO people, but we're like, Horizon, fuck yeah. yeah. Let's check this out. It could be awesome. I think the, what you said is right as well. The console community has been crying out for more MMOs. I mean, they've obviously on Xbox, we've got ESO, which, yeah, Yes. I mean, yep. now by all accounts, it's actually really good. Um, and I do intend to dip back into it at some point, probably quite soon. But when it first launched, every, what everyone wanted was Skyrim with friends. And what they got was, hey, sure. you've got this big, beautiful world that there's fuck all to do in. Uh, <laughs> and like, oh, okay, well, that's a little bit. It's like, you remember all those wonderful side quests and all that rich lore that we had in Skyrim? Nah, we binned it all, but that mountain is quite nice. And that was how it <laughs> felt. It just felt empty. Um, mm. But it was early days. But now, by all accounts, yeah. there's tons to do in it, and it's, it's a better experience. Fallout 76 was a little bit... Uh, similar for me as well like didn't feel like there was enough to do but the base of it was good right so so you've got those but the, it, but the mmo community on console has largely been free to play bombard you every 10 seconds with messages about buying loot boxes and keys mm -hmm. and things like that even some of right. them are great like neverwinter the dnd &D based one is actually really good fun um, yep. Terra is really good fun. It's got some good premises there, um, although slightly disturbing because everyone walks around essentially as very sexualized, tiny people. And it's <laughs> it's a little bit... Yeah, especially when Alan decides that that's what he's going to play and follows me around doing an uwu voice for the entire night. But that's just Alan. He just <laughs> likes to make my skin crawl. So, but, but again, the gameplay was fun and it had some good systems in it. But generally, it's a you know it's a dry market. So if they could bring something to console with some real MMO pedigree like NC Soft, then yeah, I, yeah. I think they'd be onto a winner. Yeah, I mean there are plenty of of MMOs and MMO light types. I mean Destiny is probably mm. the the most 
one of the most popular, I would never say the most popular, but one of the most popular MMO light style of games um, and for the first person shooter genre. Obviously, Warframe has been going for over a decade, hugely popular on both console and, and the PC space as well. But yeah, like more, if we get even more, it would be fantastic to... I, I'm still kind of gutted that... Um, uh, Star Wars: The Old Republic never made it to a, to a oh, console space it because so good. it would have been so good because I've oh. heard such great things about it. I remember seeing like cinematics from the game, and whenever a new expansion would come out, and the cinematics looked incredible, like Warhammer level of of mm. amazing cinematics. Mm. And that never came to the console space. But... I'm really sad about that because I remember when yeah. that came out. I at the time didn't have a rig that I could play on, so I was like, "Well, how am I supposed to play this?" Um, having only had Oh, what did we have at the time? I can't remember. Only definitely only console though, and and then like you say, Jamie, like if you don't if you don't sort of join these things right when they start, your friends who've been playing them for a month, maybe two months, are already so far above you. I mean, you could power level with them, sure, but like yeah. it just doesn't feel the same. Like you don't feel the same sense of accomplishment if you haven't, you know, and you're not working as a team, really, are you? You're just being carried by people, which is not it's satisfying really in terms hard. of gameplay. That's true. There's a, a friend of mine who's currently playing Warcraft, like getting ready for Dragonflight, which he says he'll probably not play Dragonflight for six months because he decided to go right back to the start and actually try and do everything. And so he is <laughs> wow. he has leveled a character. Um, pretty much, he's pretty much hit sixty now, but he's basically been doing all side quests and just slowly enjoying. He said because he's doing it now and he's been playing for years anyway. He can go through and do it solo. He said, "I'm playing mm-hmm. Warcraft as a single player game when you play it slowly to enjoy the story." He said, "Weirdly satisfying, even though it's an MMO." Mm. He said, "But yeah. at the same time, when I jump on, because I've still got my Warcraft subscription going at the minute, and I still hop back in. Some days you just want to fly around singing the theme tune to Flight of Dragons. It's just <laughs> that's a good time. And uh, what a yeah, movie as well. What a movie! I actually own it on Blu-ray now." Al, yes. Al found it, sent it to me. That's the most expensive Blu-ray I've ever bought. Because <laughs> uh, I don't, my, most of my collection is DVD, and I haven't upgraded. But that yeah. Blu-ray cost me about thirty-five quid, and I was Oof. like, "Do you know what? what? I'm buying it. Oh, that's absolutely worth every penny." But I digress. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Just, I love that film. <laughs> but yeah, so it. Um, but he said, "Yeah, he said that it's nice to have that character that he feels he's really experienced everything on because he came in around Mr. of Pandaria." And so there were whole swathes of it that he went through quite quickly to get up to mm-hmm. level with me and our friends, and then we all played together through the next section. And that was amazing, but the earlier bits didn't feel as much fun because he wasn't there from the beginning. So mm. it is it can be a shame. But yeah, I, th- I, think, I think Horizon has real potential for an MMO. And I have had a thing for ages where I've said, with any game, no matter what game it is, I sit there and think, I quite like an MMO of this. Because game worlds are great, and you think, God, this could be bigger, and I could be my own character, and I could do this, and I could do that, and I could yeah. see that bit that you yeah. can't see. So, wouldn't work with everything, but the thought pops into my head with nearly every game I play. So, <laughs> yeah. Well, finger, fingers crossed we get some more information on this one soon because we're just, just the thought of it has got us all really, really excited. Okay. The second one that is an NCSoft MMO. This one looks like such a contrast. And when I watched the trailer for this game called Triple L, uber cryptic name, I don't know what that signifies or stands for, I was thinking, this looks far too good to be true. It is another (laughs) trailer for an impossible looking game that they're saying is an MMO. And I was thinking, please don't be an MMO. Just make this a single player, mm-hmm. maybe co-op based game, but just maybe kind of keep it a bit more contained. And it looks phenomenal. It's a, it looks like a cross between like Anthem or The Division, third person shooter, very futuristic. And I am kind of scunnered as to what to expect from this game because it looks like there's so much going on. Obviously heavily militaristic in the future um a lot of lot of warfare and there's even seems to be like a crossover where at one point in the trailer it becomes like titanfall and the giant mechs come in and again it just looks too good to be true i'm Mm -hmm. I'm getting vibes um not visually or thematically of a game called crimson desert 
which is a fantasy MMO, which looks impossibly good and I'm hugely excited for. But again, I watched that trailer and thinking, there is no fucking way that this game is going to look this good and be an MMO and can come out in any kind of time frame. It looks impossibly good for an MMO. It looks like a current gen or next gen title that's running like natively, but not online and not MMO. MMO. Is this possible, Jamie? What do you think? It feels really ambitious. Like it, the the Titanfall vibes are strong. Like that moment in the uh, the we interstitial video where the guy climbs into the mech and then the HUD blinks in and all that. I'm like, yeah, I would I would love an MMO where I could do this. And there is a <laughs> a dearth of MMOs that are based in a more futuristic, violent environment. You know, there there is. The thing with with playing an MMO, I think the thing is that you do have there have to be areas where it's peaceful. There have to be there have to be elements that aren't just combat based. There has yeah. to be more to the world. And when you're talking about a world ravaged by war, it's a little difficult yeah. to imagine how that works. So it's easier in a fantasy setting because for a start, war can take a long time to reach you. Whereas when you've got a giant mech and you sure. can just jump into the city and punch the crap out of them, it's like, why why, why have they not attacked the city yet? I would have attacked the city by now. So. But, um, yeah, I don't know. I, I just don't know. It looks fantastic. Like It looks like the kind of uh, shooter. I think it, it, it is third person. It's not FPS, but it looks like the kind of shooter hmm. that I would play because, you know, obviously I love, I love getting to blow stuff up. Um, yeah. But yeah, I don't, I don't know. It just it looks too, it looks too polished and too big. And I wonder if it's going to be, if they make it work, is it going to be too much for a lot of systems? Is it going to suffer from people not being able sure. to play it or run it, uh, or not having the you know the connection speeds in their area or that sort of thing? But we shall see. Yeah, it's a it's a hell of that, that- you know. Start a yeah, that's why I was looking at it and thinking, I would just wish this was like a single player game or maybe a maybe a four player co op game and just have it be that instead of an MMO because then mm. you've you've you can have crazy amounts of polish but have it more kind of cooperative or a little bit of PvP like the Division Division Two had again insanely beautiful games run really really well on 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 current systems and you've still got that um, that dystopia destructed world ravaged by um in the divisions case it was by the the dollar plague or something they, they referred to it as and factions that were going up against each other and you were a division agent in that and, and I, I'd, I'd love it to be that but obviously it's, they're, they're pitching it to be an mmo and i don't know i'm i'm hugely skeptical if this is going to be an even remotely achievable but it is apparently running in engine and mm. it's obviously a, a vertical slice of um, set pieces and I'm watching the trailer here and there's these like dropships coming in that are just dropping in drop pods whether that's just I mean imagine if that was other players just coming into a barrel zone yeah but that's crazy I, it might not be it might not be that might just be scripted enemies coming in but if that was you like joining the front of a of a huge um, battle that, that was going on would be absolutely phenomenal but I'm, I'm I just I'm I'm so skeptical I want it to be true <laughs> I'm just I'm a bit jaded when it comes to MMOs this level of presentation. Mm-hmm. Sarah, please please uh, give us your thoughts. <clears throat> yeah, I mean I I I agree with both of you. Also, I have to say something about the mech suit. It feels like all three of us have identified this. This is classic like Chekhov's gun moment when you arrive at the start of the trailer and you're coming up in this little lift and there's a mech suit right in front of you. I was like, don't yeah. you show me that and don't don't you dare <laughs> tell me I, I can't go in there because I want to be in there. Um, so that instantly I was like, yep, yep, I'm in. But yeah, I, I mean, I guess they've got a while to go. They're saying releases in 2024, so they've got plenty of time to make it happen, I suppose. Um, yeah, I, I'm slightly worried about I mean, I get you know PCs these days. You know, most people have ridiculously high spec ones, and with sure. the, the forty series out now, if people can afford to get one, um, I'm sure you'd have no problem running something like this. But ugh, I guess, I guess we'll see what happens. I, I'll, I'll play it. I'll see if it if it fulfills its promises for sure. Maybe that's all. Th- that's all three play it. 
let's do that. <laughs> I'd, I'd, I'd love to. And it, it's, it seems like a big departure and a hugely ambitious um, goal for NC Soft. Very different from, from Guild Wars. Oh, yeah, of um, course. Very different from the other games that they've maybe done because this is much more third-person perspective rather than that kind of isometric, top downy sort of mm. view that you get from um, the traditional kind of MMO stuff. But... Oh my God, who knows, right? Who who knows? It's, it's, it's exciting to think about and to geek over and to get whipped up into a frenzy of the potential. But at the same time, we're like, yeah, but is it? Is it though? Come yeah. on. Is like, it so actually going to... The premise sounds absolutely nuts. How on earth are they going to... Because I... I like to understand a story and have some reasoning behind things. But like, how how are they saying that like... 10th century and 23rd century are going to coexist. Like, I love this absolutely <laughs> batshit idea, but I'm like, please make it make sense mm. or at least justify it in some way so that I, it's not like, oh, we just thought this would be fun. Let's do this. Like, yeah, I'm really curious to see how that will work as well. That's the thing. I will suspend disbelief to a massive amount for stuff as long as there is just some plot point I can hang my hat on. Yeah. So if yeah. they say, yeah. oh, we were experimenting with time travel and we broke everything. And I'll be like, mm-hmm. that'll do. Okay, fine. Yeah, that makes sense. You broke it. But if they're just mm-hmm. like, this looks good, doesn't it? And you sat there like, why does it though? Yeah. And there's nothing, yeah. you know, like any Asylum movie or Michael Bay movie. Like there's nothing <laughs> that you can explain that makes sense. Um <laughs> But it explodes and it looks pretty. So, but yeah, the the other thing as well that got me though, I wonder how much of an MMO it'll be, um, because you mentioned Destiny before, and obviously Destiny is MMO light, but it's yeah, you've got sure. lots of players in the the hub, but you're only going to go out with three at a time, and you're not going to see mm. other players wandering around. So it, that makes it more doable and still feels like an interconnected world. Um, although for yeah. God's sake, don't tell Activision it's an MMO; they don't like it. Um, <laughs> I will never forget the amount of times that I heard Activision use the phrase, it's not an MMO, and we were all sat there going, it's an MMO though, isn't it? It's, it's, this is quite a yeah, lot, isn't it? They were worried it would scare people off, and how, how do we market <laughs> that to console players when they just want a yep. first-person shooter from Bungie? Yeah, I remember that. But thinking about it, maybe this is part of the reason why, because that was MMO-esque. It had an MMO elements and enough to make it good, but it wasn't mm-hmm. you know, hundreds of people. I mean, I'm thinking of Stormwind, on my Alliance character when I would land and couldn't see the floor for people just carpeting the place. You know, I couldn't even get to the mailbox right. in there on the heavier servers I was on. You mentioned that and look at those graphics and all I can imagine is my PC bursting into flames. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but if you've got a little bit more reserved and a little bit, you know, it's like, oh, when you're just out in the general areas, you're not going to see people. But when you go to these certain points, you can interact with them and maybe, you know, emote and stuff you get that element without it being too much. So I suppose it's uh, it's levels of MMO, isn't it? But, definitely, but it looks good. No, definitely. Mm-hmm. I know. And I think you're right. If, if they go maybe the more the Destiny route rather than the World of Warcraft and um, Final Fantasy fourteen route, then maybe it is more manageable, a bit more contained. You can still do the big multiplayer raid type of activities. But if you just want to do some questing, some fire team stuff, then it's a bit. It's like just it's just your kind of three players, four players, and you're not necessarily going to be running into fifty other people in mm. a particular area, wherever you've instanced an, an activity or something like that. Unless there is, uh, and I'm, I'm going to be referring to Destiny here because that's that's the one I'm I guess most familiar with. Is if you have a public event like you do in Destiny, then you maybe get like. Th- three or four other other random players just joining that event. But you, it's only ever like a maximum of maybe six to maybe seven in, in public events. You usually don't get like a colossal amount of 20 or 30 other players just like congregating for, for public events because they're much more smaller activities. Like maybe just like a boss to, to fight or something like that. And you hmm. still got the strikes, you still got the raid activities. So I wonder if they do take that approach or if they want to really push out the potential for what an MMO can be in you know the next four years five years or something like that to say that we are going nuts with this you can have armies on the ground doing activities together sort of well not really together because it'd just be <laughs> just be chaos <laughs> but maybe that maybe they want this this kind of battlefield real feel whereas it's, it's like a big 
quote, you know, no pun intended, a battlefield game where you've got a hundred players just having these these combine counters, but then you can maybe just splinter off and do side questing activities and and that kind of stuff. Again, that's another hugely exciting potential MMO project coming from from yeah. NCSoft. But god damn, they must be absolutely massive company. <laughs> yeah, right there, Jesus. Anyway, so next topic, uh, let's talk about the Perceiver, which got its debut trailer just um, a few days ago, about a week ago. Um, came out of nowhere. Was not expecting anything of this. Um, didn't even know it existed at all. And it looks like just this amazing cross of Chinese mythology. It's something that we've talked about a lot of wanting more Chinese mythology games as opposed to Japanese mythology, which seems to get done all the time. Um, So Chinese mythology crossed with a bit of Ghost of Tsushima world, open world vibes, um, with the the blistering combat from something like uh, From Software Sekiro. That's my kind of influences that I'm that I'm picking up on in this game. And I know, Sarah, you see games like this and you get whipped up to a frenzy, just like myself. <laughs> what what were your thoughts watching this trailer? Because it's a good seven minute trailer. There's a lot of stuff in here. Yeah, yeah. I was yeah, I was captivated, absolutely. I, I was I thought it was really interesting. The first sort of half of the trailer was quite like um stark. Um, like in terms of the colors, it was quite, it felt really realistic. It had a kind of, you know, a heightened sense to it. Um, but then there was this massive flip about halfway through the trailer and the whole like environment was like twisting. The colors were like super saturated, like this amazing pinks and like oranges coming through. And I was like, what is this? This is insane. Cause it felt like it was quite subdued. And then it was like, no, 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 yeah. this is not the case. Um, and also there seems to be this whole kind of uh, concept of the actor in a play. And I'm like, okay, take my money. All right. <laughs> um, yep. But this idea of like, does an actor, is, you know, it's like, does when a tree falls in the wood, you know, can you hear it making a sound? It's like when an actor, when an actor puts on a character, does the character actually exist? Is that a real person? Mm. And they become, and this, yeah, I love this idea. It sounds super cool. And like, uh, yeah, I I loved Ghost of Tsushima, and if it's anything like that, which it looks like it is, but with Chinese mythology, I'm like absolutely, I'm so here for it. I'm very very excited. And when is it coming out? Because I want it. I know, I know. <laughs> there was so many like gameplay stuff that we saw as well. There was obviously a lot of like the parrying system that that chink sound of blades mm. striking each other which you get from Sekiro like really tight combat but like the the poetry aspect of the playtelling and then there was this like Mega Man mechanic where if you defeat a character or a boss you take on their power by wearing their mask and you transform mm. into that character you're thinking holy shit this is just absolutely incredible and it really seems to be as you said, Sarah, it opened up that subdued, maybe a bit more of a straightforward Chinese set story. Mm-hmm. But then it goes, it goes full tilt, twisted into mythology, and then the environments start getting literally twisted around, and the the colorscape changes, and the little bits of cinematography that we saw in the trailer as well, where there's that big um, boss fight. It looked like a boss fight of the character who was like raven dressed. Like that oh, reminds yeah. me of like the the one of the Bloodborne fights of the character, uh, in in that in that series, and it just looks so beautiful. Mm-hmm. And I hope it's open world. I really do because when the trailer got to that point where the character was just like walking through these environments, and we got to see these different, um these different thematic worlds, uh, the different color scapes and everything. It just looked so beautiful and at times tranquil, at times ultra violent, mm. at times very crouching tiger, hidden dragon or house yeah. of the flying daggers, two of my all time favorite Chinese cinema movies. And it just looks like, okay, when can, when can I get this? I can't wait for, for 2025 to get this game. I need it. Oh, I need so it now. Oh I need it now. <laughs> And I have no idea when it's going to come out, but it could be a really long time. But oh, it looks like that, and it's from a developer I'd, I'd never heard from. It, it was like Paper. Is that the developer? And that was the logo at the beginning. I don't know if that's a developer or just a publisher. But again, it, I know very little about the game as to who's behind it. 
it just looks so beautiful and it's channeling so many influences and themes and mechanics amazing. that they're sh- packing in there oh i'm excited jamie are you excited i can tell by your demeanor that you're you're beside yourself with excitement i no, <laughs> that's your just, excited face i'm just trying not to actually perish live on camera um no i uh okay I had never heard of it, and you sent us a link to the the YouTube trailer, and my first thought was the perceiver's a terrible name, and, and <laughs> I couldn't help it because I I was in one of those moods when I watched it this morning. Anyway, I was like, "Oh great, a D tier DC villain, right?" So I, was like, I am the perceiver. I notice all, and, like, and, I, and I was like, "Oh, I get fucked," and I put I, I hit play, and there's just someone cutting about with a sword. And it's a little bit bland, and it's very pretty, you know, very very pretty, like graphically stunning. But mm. it's just like, and then the turn was like, oh, ting ting. I enjoyed the dialogue, although I did have that thought. Mm. It's like, how do these people have such a good conversation while kicking the crap out of each other? Because <laughs> yeah, not breathless can, at all. It's just yeah, yeah, I can barely talk to someone if I'm walking up a flight of stairs behind them. So I'm like, this is ridiculous. But I watch it. I'm like, okay, it just looks like another. It looks like a very good example of people hitting each other with swords. This is. And then suddenly it goes batshit insane, and I was instantly sold. And I cannot wait for this fucking game to come out. I'll even forgive it being called the Perceiver. At this point, I'm like, yeah, the Perceiver. That's an A plus <laughs> villain. Like, I want to perceive things. Like, but the yeah, it looks amazing. I love the like the sort of the hint of metaphor in the dialogue about the the play and, and like the embodiment of character. But and but then they're literally doing it. They pop on the mask. People turning into cherry blossom, world spinning, and like, good God, it looks good. I, I was yeah. so ready from the first couple of like minutes. I was so ready to be coming on and going like, ah, oh, it's pretty. I don't really know, like you know. Hope everyone enjoys. And then by the end of that trailer, I was just, just yeah, I, I'm just throwing my uh, you know debit card at the screen, going, take the fucking money, give me the game. So yeah, <laughs> I'm actually really hyped for this now. Came out of nowhere, and I can't wait. Bloody brilliant. So, I know. So before any YouTube comments or uh, comments come in um, about Jamie talking about the being able to talk whilst you're fighting, I think that's supposed to be a retelling. Like a, a I narrator is so, re- yeah. retelling of the events. He's not saying, not trying to have a conversation whilst chopping somebody's head off or anything like that. No, I'm assuming. No. Who knows? We we perceive these events um, before us, but we don't know. Perceive. But yeah, it looks nice, so nice. good. It just looks so good. Again, it's, it's, it's a game that came out of nowhere and mm. it hit the PlayStation channel as if to say, there you go, guys. There, there's a new trailer. We're just going to drop in. No information in the YouTube mm. description whatsoever. Nothing at all. They've just like uploaded the video and forgot to put any information in there to say, yeah, this is, this is getting worked on. What do you think? And it's, and everybody's like, oh my God, where do I wishlist this? Can yeah. we get it now? What's going on? We need to know everything. And I'm I'm just hugely excited for it as well. But again, I get hugely excited for so many things. It's, uh, it, it gets tiresome being hugely excited all the time. I need to just, oh, I need to channel more Jamie of just being placid and it's like aloof of like wow. nonchalant about everything. Yeah, Wait, just have a headache for a week. You'll be fine. You'll be so aloof. <laughs> It'll level so, you out. Yeah. It, well, I have had nice. back pain for two weeks. That's kind of on a par. Oh, there you go. See, that's it. You just just ride that wave. Just. Uh, you know, feel the slight low level misery at all times, and then you'll be able to, <laughs> and you can just turn it on when you need it. But no, I think, like, seriously, it, it's a really good way of doing a trailer because it wasn't like I was looking at it thinking this looks bad. I was just thinking, like, oh, okay, this looks fine. This looks pretty. I'll wait to yeah. find out more. Um, and, but this does, you know, there's not a lot going on. And then it just, it, it's like someone sits there and just leans in and whispers to you and goes, yeah, no, it's not what you think. Get ready, motherfucker. And then it just, <laughs> boom. And I'm like, okay. And I'm like, yeah, I was, that's brilliant marketing to me because it really mm. did, it sold me instantly. And it, I always think it's like downplaying itself for a little bit and then going, no, we've, we've got we got shit you ain't seen. And it's just like, yeah, okay, yeah. Yep. Yeah. yeah, no, I'm really excited about this one. Yeah. Um, I, I'm now in a, in a position where we've been wanting... Chinese mythology games for for so long, now we're getting an abundance of them 
or a loss of them, maybe not an abundance of them, but we're getting m- way more that are looking really, really good. And as well as the, the Japanese mythology ones as well, like Rise of the Ronin, which we talked about um, mm. a few episodes ago, there's Where the Winds Meet, which looks phenomenal. That looks like very much a Chinese Assassin's Creed with more kind of mm. epic presentation. We're getting this one, The Perceiver. We're getting Black Myth Wukong at some point, which continually drops um, trailers that, are, that look epic, and that's more around the Monkey King mythology. And now, now I'm incredibly worried about what Assassin's Creed are going to do with their Japanese setting and their their other projects, which are looking at Chinese mythology, which are looking at Japanese mythology. And I'm thinking, have they waited too long? And now we're getting these other projects, which are really looking phenomenal. And they're just going to get steamrolled and overtaken and maybe not get the success that everybody wanted way back, like five, ten years ago. Everybody wanted a feudal Japan setting. Now we're getting all these other games coming out that are possibly going to be doing it better and different, different takes on it. And is it going to get lost in the shuffle? Because we've now got so many. I don't know. Mm, Maybe. And it's true. I think... The minute everyone found out that Assassin's Creed 2 was different time period, different setting, and when it was like, this is what we're doing, I think that was the first moment that everyone sort of went, when's Japan? Like, I, I it yeah. instantly became a thing that everyone wanted. So, yeah, like it's, it's hype that's been built for a long time, and then so many other people have done it so well, or were doing it so well. I think you're right. It's They run the risk of not... They need to make a really, really solid game that lovingly treats the mythology and the history like and and i mean it's assassin's creed they'll 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 struggle it'll through be good. whatever happens won't mm, they? yeah but, it'll be it'll yeah, be really good and that. it will look fantastic yeah but we shall see i know i know okay the witcher 3 i know sarah is a huge fan of the witcher 3 wild hunt very um this will probably be a very quick topic actually because there's there's hardly any information and the only information there is is their Twitter post to say the next gen update for The Witcher 3 Wild Hunt is coming on December 14th for free for everyone who already owns the game. For more details and gameplay reveal, tune in to Red Streams next week, which will be, I don't know, what date is that? I have no idea. A week from now is, hold on, let me pull up my calendar, should be the week of the 21st to the 25th. 27th uh, will be that week i'm guessing they're going to be they haven't put a date in there so they're they're super mm. cryptic they're they're being incredibly unhelpful as old cdpr giving us an actual date as to when this is going <laughs> to happen they just said yeah next week sometime um so we're going to get more information then so what's good is that on next week's show we should have more information to be able to talk about it properly but for the here and now i want to get sarah's thoughts because she's an uber fan Oh, of what, what do you want what are you looking forward to what would you want this next gen update to have in it for your That's playstation really 5 yeah. I, I mean i just i like the idea of it looking looking prettier maybe i don't know is it gonna up the frames per second maybe that'd be that'd be interesting I, I i personally didn't have any issues with the gameplay anyway when playing it through for the first time um it'd be interesting to see if they're gonna do the dlcs as well um probably they will right i would think uh, they would have to they, they would, would have, have to, to right? bundle everything in yeah maybe or maybe they won't do it in this first release maybe they'll release them a little bit later um but it's such a great game and such an like a a vast world um yeah one of the things i love about witcher is like you can wander into an area and be like do 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 oh shit that thing just like one bang killed me okay cool let's not go here <laughs> or let's get roach and just like go straight through this area to the other yep. side um but yeah it's a great game um I, i'm trying to think what i would want from it but i i don't know i seriously didn't really have that that any issues that i can remember during gameplay but maybe it's because it was you know, I was playing it at the time that it came out and everything else around that time felt similar, so it didn't feel clunky by comparison to anything else. Maybe now that I've played more things on, on the PS5, coming back to it, if I were to go to the previous version, maybe I'd be like, eh, I don't want this, I want something smoother. Um, Yeah, I don't know, what would you want, Ross? Because you've played this game as well, right? I have, I have. I played it and I have finished it. Um, I, it's a game where it's so massive, I couldn't 
do everything. I just had to get to a point where I said, okay, like I'm a hundred hours in now. I just have to stop doing all of these fucking question marks that keep continuously <laughs> popping up so in Novigrad fun. and everywhere. <laughs> just golden path it, and I ended up doing that, and I and I and I got through the through the game. I haven't put it in the DLCs. I was thinking about replaying it um, to do the DLCs, but then this got announced and kept getting delayed. I thought, well, I'm going to wait for the next gen update to finally address the DLCs and the expansion packs and everything because apparently they're really good. Mm. And I was thinking, I'm looking forward to this in a big, big way. I want to see what they're going to be adding to the experience, how they're going to be improving different things. Maybe it's maybe it's quality of life stuff. I'm not expecting Mm. it to be a remake like a Resident Evil 2 or a Resident Evil 4 project. That's just, yeah. that I just don't think is possible. We're going to be getting that with The Witcher 1, which will come out in a couple of years' time. But this, I would imagine it would be a spruce up, maybe improved lighting and textures. Maybe mm. they might improve some animation stuff. It could be, at times, yeah. could feel a little bit kind of jank. I would love Geralt to be able to fall further than two feet without taking health damage. That would be wonderful. <laughs> if they could do that, that would be incredible. You're, you're a fucking witcher, for God's sake. You're supposed to be a monster beater, monster hunter, and you, you just trip over a little wall and you fucking take health off. I mean, what's going on there? Gravity, anyway. his ultimate enemy. Exactly, yeah, that's his kryptonite. <laughs> Actually, what I was going to say. <laughs> <laughs> I know. This is not a FromSoft game. Gravity is not your enemy, Geralt. Come on. <laughs> but I would imagine they'll be improving like the lighting textures, um, maybe giving like performance modes, graphical modes, things yeah. like that. They may even, um, whether whether they will do this or not, but they're, they're a big proponent of the mod community, kind of like what Bethesda do with their, with their modding um, support for the community as well. They might even take some mods and make that part of like the 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 build for this next gen stuff. That would be super interesting because mm. these games, like an Elder Scrolls, Skyrim, or Oblivion, when modders can go to town with installing like five hundred plus mods in their games, they can be transformative. And I've seen some um, channels like like Digital Dreams, I think, is a, is a big YouTube channel that does this kind of stuff. It's like this is what these games can look like if you if you install six hundred mods in this exact order oh, yes, of sequence. Yes. <laughs> Only yeah. this exact order mm-hmm. of sequence. Yep. It can look amazing. So maybe they might say, actually, you know, some of our modders have done some really interesting stuff with this game. Let's take them and make them part of the main build of the game and we'll release That's it cool. as a next gen update for free and um all that kind of good stuff. Whether it's gonna have like ray tracing, maybe for a PC version could be could be super interesting. I remember the one of the original launch reveal trailer not launch trailer a reveal teaser trailer for wild hunt looked spectacular and there was it was during that time of this is what we're aiming for and here's what we delivered what we delivered mm-hmm. was still visually incredible but it was that that downgrade conspiracy yeah. watergate kind of thing of yeah, but we you you showed us this and you haven't given us this. You've given us something else. Uh, like the puddles in Spider-Man, that kind of stuff. Yeah. yeah. So maybe it will get back to that, maybe that original vision, which would be below everybody's socks off with water reflections and mm. lighting and extra extra stuff, just extra stuff, extra polish yeah, and make it licking nice and paint. Shiny. Yeah. But again, I'm similar to you, um, Sarah. Like, I loved the first game. I didn't have a problem with the gameplay as such. Mm. Um, um, they later released uh, an extra kind of combat move set for Geralt as one of the updates. Again, I never had a problem with the combat. I really, really liked it. So what I'm expecting is probably very little. What I'm hoping for is also very little. Maybe just make it just a little bit a little bit slicker, a little bit more polished. Mm. Um, I, I'm, I'm wondering free. if they're... Yeah, I'm wondering if they're... <laughs> pressured to do something substantial with this because they're in this phase of rebuilding the reputation of cdpr after after cyberpunk after a whole bunch of other stuff they say well we are going to just maybe port it with some basic upgrades but actually we should probably go the extra mile here to build our reputation back up again i really don't know i really don't know that makes sense. Jamie, you're a Witcher fan. Yeah. I've never played... Well, I played for 10 minutes um, and then sort of put it down, got called away to do something. 
Can't remember <laughs> what. And I was like, oh, I'll get back to that. That looks really good. Never played it. <laughs> um, I should, really, because it's very much my cup of tea. And I've watched people play. Uh, there's a, a great streamer that I enjoy. Uh, Uni Fade Walker plays basically Mass Effect and Witcher pretty much exclusively, just does different runs. And um, they are tremendously entertaining. And I've watched them play uh, The Witcher. And I've got friends who play The Witcher. And I'm like, yeah, this looks like something I should get into. I just haven't had the. I, it's not even so much the time. There's been times when I've looked at picking it up and I've started another game because I know I'm going to lose a large portion of my life to it. And <laughs> yeah, I'm, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm not going to max the Fog Detective trilogy by <laughs> going and playing The Witcher for God's sake. So, uh, but yeah, I'll I'll get around to it. I'll get around yeah. to it. Yeah, and talk about a franchise which would be really deserving of a, of the MMO treatment as well. Like build mm. to create your own Ooh. Witcher, pick your own school, so... your Witcher school. Oh yes, please. The potential there is, is also massive. NC Soft, you've got clearly nothing to do at the moment. But just just <laughs> jump over here yeah. to Poland, and we can work on a a Witcher <laughs> MMO as well. Anyway. They're just cutting about doing nothing. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> exactly. It's not like you have two <laughs> epic projects in the works already, but. The 2022 nominees for the Game Awards. So we're already at an hour. Um, I would imagine we're not going to be talking about absolutely every single category here. But if there's a particular category that each of you want to pull out and talk about, obviously fantastic. I was thinking about just doing maybe like the main ones, the top row sort of thing. If you, I don't really, I don't really know content creator of the year. Um, the esports stuff, I don't really have much skin in the game for any of that kind of stuff or knowledge base for that there's a lot of things that i don't really um i don't really follow mm. um there's a lot of games that i even haven't played that are actually nominated here so that's obviously great to say oh maybe i should check those out but um i wanted to uh, obviously get each of you to talk about what your thoughts are for like game of the year maybe best direction best narrative art direction score and music audio design performance games for impact ongoing indie we'll probably take up to indie um, and and if you want to add any other ones in, we can just kind of talk about that as well because I've got the website up here so I can navigate around as well. So the very first category is the is is the one is game of the year, recognizing a game that delivers the absolute best experience across all creative and technical fields. And the nominees were a Plague Tale Requiem, which was awesome to see for a Sober Studios, Elden Ring, God of War Ragnarok. Horizon Forbidden West, Stray, which I was really surprised by, and Xenoblade Chronicles 3. So I'm going to start with Sarah. Sarah, is this a, is this a two-horse race? Or do you think... <laughs> it's a one-horse race for me. It's a one-horse race, okay. Yeah, it's got to be God of War, Ragnarok, and I haven't even completed it. Um, followed very closely by Elden Ring, then Stray, which I absolutely love. Really? Played... Yeah, okay. I love it. It was so okay. good. Okay. Um, I haven't played a Plague Tale Requiem because I haven't finished the first one yet, um, and I also haven't played um, Xenoblade Chronicles. So then I would probably put Horizon, Stray Horizon. Yeah, yeah. Well, I played Stray for more than I played Horizon. So oh, interesting. Yeah. You really threw me there when you said it can, it can be only one, and then you said Ragnarok. I'm really surprised because my I was number say Elden Ring. I thought you were going to say Elden Ring. Elden Ring is my number one, despite my, how much love I I have for for Ragnarok, which I have finished in this entire well, not in its entirety. I golden pathed it. I forty percent complete, so there's a ton of stuff I obviously missed. But I was so compelled by the main story that I finished it. I'm not going to discuss it just yet. Um, we'll, I'll wait till no I finish it. No spoilers. <laughs> no spoilers. But I I still think that Elden Ring is still my number one. Um, but again, I. Whichever one gets it, it makes no difference to me at yeah, all. Agreed. Like, agreed. They're they're these two games are at the absolute top of their craft. Um, Elden Ring being the open world Souls experience, the the probably the best iteration of that style of game that FromSoft created and and pioneered, and Ragnarok, big epic storytelling, performance capture, um, just 
com- visceral combat and that story and that emotion is like this this the it's the best um of where we're at uh, in the industry absolutely stunning Ragn- um sorry let me see where are we, where are we, where are we? straight I haven't played um um requiem i haven't finished at all horizon forbidden west see i'm a bit sticky on horizon forbidden west i was so excited about it when it got announced and that first trailer was shown off and we saw the big mammoth creature i was so hyped for it and then i played it and i've only ever gotten a couple of hours in and i thought this is just i i and it, 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 it's shameful to say but i was bored I thought this is just more of the same and then not in a way that more of the same of Ragnarok is more of the same and then building it and it's epic mm-hmm. right from the right from the punch right from the get-go on Ragnarok it is so captivating mm-hmm. and it, it, it cooks you in and carries you all the way I was just doing menial tasks for some NPCs in Horizon Forbidden West I thought this is not grabbing me at all and I still haven't gone back to it I, I plan to go back to it because Everybody's saying that once it gets going, it will grab you and it's fantastic, but you have to get over like the first half dozen hours or so. And that thought is just like, well, I mean, I don't want to do half dozen hours before the game gets good. I want it to get good yeah. right from the punch, right from the punch. Let's go. Mm-hmm. And I've never went, gone back to it. And I really need to because I know it's a good game because everybody's telling me it's a good game. But I'm really surprised that Horizon Run West was actually on this list because it felt like really two Sony first-party games are up for Game of the Year. I would have thought just on maybe on like principle or or rules or guidelines, they would have said, no, 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 you can't have one platform holder, can't have two. It needs to be one, and I would have expected God of War Ragnarok being like that. Mm. But like Xenoblade Chronicles, I've, I've never played the series. I don't know anything about that, and obviously I haven't played Stray. I, I know people were losing their shit over been able to have a cat game and they were loving that like cats are dicks so you can now be a dick like they like the goat simulator <laughs> games you know so i don't have any skin in the game for stray either i'm really surprised that stray get voted for game of the year i'm really shocked about that i thought is it really that good i know the artistic direction is really cool but really game of the year i i wouldn't put it in the same category as god of war personally but it was a fantastic game and I really enjoyed it and it was challenging and it was fun and the story was really cool. So like, I think it, I think it deserves to be nominated whether or not it deserves to be nominated for game of the year. I don't know. Interesting. Jamie, any thoughts on, on these games? I don't imagine you've had a chance to play any of them. I haven't played a single game in that category. Um, (laughs) So from a very real perspective, I have absolutely nothing to offer. The only thing I will say is, okay, I'm going to preface this with personal opinion and, sure. and very much, you know, being a nearly 40, very jaded man of some experience in, in the gaming world, is it not all just bollocks? <laughs> oh, the- yes. That it gives us something to way. argue about, Jamie, and talk about. I What's know, the internet going to do if they can't argue? I know. The only thing I will say is that I do, I do see some people getting really bent out of shape when one yeah. game wins a game of the year over the other and things like that. And I just think to myself, sure. it's sure. subjective. It's based mm-hmm. on a vote. It's a popularity contest. You can't really... There is no way in hell you can compare God of War Ragnarok to Stray. They're two different genres, two different games. Yep. And for me, I put Minecraft above either of them because that's the one I'm currently playing and getting the most out of. I don't know how you put a game up for Game of the Year that's been out for a fucking week. So Ragnarok shouldn't even be in the running on that basis. And only mm. on that basis. And because I do think it's usually deserving of its nomination because everything I've seen suggests it's absolutely fantastic and I totally get why it's there. So I'm not knocking it. I'm just saying that it's... It's an odd thing. The Game of the Year Awards has always been an odd thing for me because it is yeah. so subjective. And But there are people who treat it as though it's like, well, that, that means that's the best game. It's like, it's only the best game if it's your best game. So yeah. this is going to be one of those things that we're going to see over the next couple of weeks all over Twitter, if it's still going by then. So if not, all over Mastodon. Um, but with people just <laughs> raging about 
you know, turning to lifelong friends or family members and going, you're wrong and I hate you because you prefer <laughs> Elden Ring to... And I'm just sat back thinking, just like games and stop being idiots, please. <laughs> so I that's know. most of where I get to. But realistically, I I, yeah, I haven't played any of them. I think personally, from everything I've seen, there's no way in hell it's going to do anything other than either Elden Ring or Ragnarok. And I think mm-hmm. Ragnarok might edge out Elden Ring with the love yeah. that it has. Yeah. So, and I, sure. I would say it's probably fair from what I see. It's certainly, from having watched both of the games being played, Ragnarok looks like the one that I would thoroughly enjoy more than Elden Ring because I'm not really a, yeah. a Soulsborne type. So, but yeah. Exactly. exactly. I, I only pick Elden Ring because I think of the impact that had on the people that would normally never touch a Souls game. Mm. Like, it was everywhere. It was, everybody was streaming it, and the amount of sales that it got, it it changed people's opinion of a Souls game and got them mm-hmm. into that genre. And that's that's why I'm landing on Elden Ring as, as probably for, for Game of the Year. But, like, ultimately, yeah. Ultimately, it doesn't matter to anybody, but some people, like, they, they need that sticker on the box to say, Game yeah. of the Year... <laughs> Guys, this was the best game that year. We're so, going to get more sales. Is this entirely uh, voted for by the general public, or is there an element of industry-based judging? Like, how does this actually work? Because I'm trying to think of it. I was trying to compare it to something like the Oscars or the BAFTAs, for example. Yeah, like it's not really the same, is it? Because it's got such a huge popularity contest element to it in terms of there the is that. Public voting. Yeah, there is that, but there's also a huge um, uh, judging body. Oh, cool. yeah. from 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 industry people as well mm-hmm. as um the audience votes and, and public votes as well so i think it's i don't know if it's quite 50 50 but there is a significant portion of public votes and but there's also a major uh, portion of industry people who are mm-hmm. um allocated as judges as like to cast panel. their their vote as well yeah okay yeah, exactly well, in that sense then i think it's i think it Maybe we need to reframe it because, you know, it's it's hard not to do the whole like, oh, yeah, I chose the, the game of the year. I'm better than you because you think this other game is better, <laughs> blah, blah, blah. But like maybe it needs to be looked at from the perspective of the, the, the devs. Like they appreciate this acknowledgement. Someone like the community and this judging panel saying that their game is the best game. And that's the better way to look at it, because if we get hung up on the fact that I, I said God of War, you said Elden Ring. Um, mm. Uh, and and you know one of us will win in a way uh, if one of us chooses right. Like I yeah I just think it's a it, yeah it takes away from the fact that we should just be enjoying these games. I think these awards, whilst we vote in them, are uh, I would like to think are more for the people who have made the games. Um, and I oh, say yeah. I I appreciate your yeah. game or I appreciate your music. I appreciate the direction you did or the audio design etc. Yeah. It's the same with any kind of recognition, right? You want to be patted on the back and recognized for your work. And if you don't get that, you think that you're, what you've created has no worth and it's ultimately yeah. meaningless. And that's what that's the big thing about award shows in general. It's like, you, do we really need that kind of validation? And then there's a huge demographic to say, well, in order to get funding for your next game, you need that validation yeah. or your yeah. next project or whatever. And it's it can be ultra brutal. Mm-hmm. And... I, I I take issue with with the game awards for the time in which the time of the year in which they roll out the nominations and actually host the event. So the event is mm-hmm. in December, but voting or I guess qualification to submit your game is like the beginning of November, and there's a whole bunch of games that are still to come out for this year and that are ineligible. Like I would have expected awards for the Callisto Protocol for yeah. for potentially mm. Game of the Year, art direction, um, I don't know, audio design, things like that. But because that comes out in like the first week of December, I think that's the date or roughly, it's ineligible because you've already fucking announced your your nominees in November. Yeah. yeah. And there's there's loads of games like that. Like the one that just came out from Obsidian, I think it was it Pentiment or something like that it's called. It is getting 10 out of 10s across the board, which is a narrative mm. game. It looks like very illustrative, almost like a medieval tapestry kind of aesthetic to everything. It mm. looks just fantastic. And it is getting banger review after banger review. But guess what? It came out too late for the cutoff for the Game Awards because of their 
if the game launches within a year, January to December, to the end of December, it should be eligible for nominations and awards or anything like that. And because of that, the Custo Protocol or Pentiment or um, like Vampire Survivors, I think, made it by the skin of his teeth and it got Best Indie Debut nomination. Like that, that for Vampire Survivors, because they made the cut there, they have now got, we want funding for our next project. We got awarded or nominated for a Best Indie Debut Game. That means that we're going to secure payroll and funding for our next project much, much easier than we released an indie game and it did X numbers and didn't get any real attention. Yeah. It's um, Sh- a shame ahead, that they do Jimmy. in November. Yeah, Jimmy. No, I was just going to say, I think that the, everyone knows I like to have a rant about stuff anyway, so I go off on one. But my my thing really is the fact that for me, it, it just always, it, it, it chafes at me slightly because there's so much infighting in the game community about what's best game and exclusivity and, and this and that verse. And it's always versus versus versus. So I'm like gaming is supposed to be fun and we're supposed to enjoy it. And I think people put too much onus. Like you said, the, the, uh, like Sarah said, these awards are fantastic that they recognize the hard work of the people who made the games. They're not a badge for you as someone who played it to wear on your lapel and say, I'm better than you because I played the game of the year. And like, because ultimately as well, it's like, I could I could hold my own game of the year award. I could I could fire up a Twitch stream and have three people watch it and get them to tell me which game they prefer and go game of the year. And <laughs> yep. It theoretically it doesn't, but if it, it, it from my perspective and from that you know just making a little badge means exactly the same thing. It lacks the fact of you know the critical review and the, the thousands upon thousands of people voting, but. From if I just want to point out that the game I played was better than the game you played, then I can then that's it. It's done. I've, I've said mm. the words. That's my game of the year. Mm, um, mm. So yeah, it, it's 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 all subjective, and I think that's the thing. I think it all needs to be taken as. I I think it needs to be better explained what the game of the year actually is as well, and what the awards do. Like the, I don't really know the structure of the. I I believe it is similar. To the, the the one I compare it to is the Eurovision Song Contest, because it's like we have a critical board who will actually sit down and say, "Okay, this was yeah. well conceived, and this was." And then the other bit is going, "Well, I don't like Belgium, so there's no way I'm voting for Belgium," mm. like, which is what essentially sure. people are doing. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's yeah. So you've got the the mix of the two. Like, explain the split, explain how it works, and really highlight when they post these games why that game is so good and what was so good about it and what the devs did to make it special. And it would feel a bit more... um, I don't know, it would feel a bit more meaningful, maybe. You know, because it Mm. is... They do deserve... You know, they deserve all the praise in the world for these games, but I just... I don't know that it... I don't know if people realise that that's what they're they're voting for as opposed to mm. well my mate Jeff didn't play this and therefore he's a wanker so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah it is so subjective isn't it like at the end of the day that's that's the main issue isn't it it's that my game of the year may not be somebody else's game of the year and that's okay like yeah it's great that there's an award ceremony out there in which like a game will win but that doesn't mean that whatever my game of the year is if it doesn't win isn't also a game of the year for me. Sure. You know? And yeah. also, I think what sucks about what you were saying, Ross, about the cutoffs and everything, surely any games that are coming out December, January will kind of get lost because by the time we roll around to next year's award ceremony, there'll have been another 10 months worth of games. And we're not thinking about what we played in December, January. We're thinking about what yeah. we played in June, July, mm-hmm. August, and, and, you know, and, I'm thinking Ragnarok and it literally just came out a couple of weeks ago, right? But it's crazy to think that some games that may be exceptionally good, like, for example, Callista Protocol, may not even be in the running for Game of the Year next year because of all the plethora of other games that will come out in between now and the next ceremony. So that sucks. And that will always, I guess, be the case no matter when you hold the ceremony because it will always have you know, whatever comes out or just misses the cutoff date will be at the top end of the list of things for next time 
Yeah, recency is, is definitely a bias for, for a lot of decision making as well. It's like, what am I mm-hmm. playing right at this minute? Oh, that's that's front of mind. I'm going to nominate that as opposed yeah. to, I remember last year, um, I think it was last year anyway, Hitman 3 came out. And that was by far one of the best games of that year. But it launched in January and was largely forgotten about by the time the end of the year comes around. Mm-hmm. And if you look at the package, by certainly by the end of the year, like that game had so much content, it had so much polish, it had so much replayability, and I think it was largely forgotten about in terms of nominations and things like that. And it was by far the best iteration of a Hitman game that IO Interactive ha- had ever produced. Not only that, but they upgraded the first two Hitman games into the Hitman 3 engine for free, and you can play it within Hitman 3 from the menu screen, kind of like a Master Chief Collection sort of package, mm. where you just play through every single one of the Hitman games. And again, it was it was that recency bias of, yeah, but it was way back in January, and we, we've got other things to play uh, by mm-hmm. the end of the year, and, um, and that's the games that get surfaced and all the attention and the nominations. But anyway, that's fine. We don't have to go through all the awards. That's, that's totally fine. Jamie fucking derailed the entire topic, but that's fine. Sorry. That's, I, that's I, fine. <laughs> I apologize profusely. I also apologize for the no doubt many hate comments that will pop up in the YouTube video. No, I thought it was really good. It was so much more thought provoking. Uh, and, exactly. and Ross and I would have just shouted at each other about what the actual best game is. <laughs> yeah, I really wanted an argument, you bastard, and you just totally <laughs> taken me off. I mean, topic. You made no, us that's think. Fine. <laughs> yeah, the how dare you make us think, Jamie? <laughs> the thing is, though, Elden Ring and God of War Ragnarok are still both really fucking good and probably the only two in there that are likely to win it. So, yeah. fight! Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I would lose because Sarah has me on her. So I would yeah, I could literally fight. bash you around the head with it. I know. I know. <laughs> but anyway, oh, shit. let's end the show there. That was actually really good. An hour and 25 minutes of really great topics. And really thought-provoking conversation from from Jamie there. Thank you, Sam. Can I do a little shout-out, though? Oh, yes, yes, yes. Shout-out. Shout-out. Yeah, um, uh, Roll7, who did Rollerdrome, um, were nominated for Best Sports Slash Racing um, for Oli Oli World, which is the other game that they they produced. So oh, awesome. Please vote for that. <laughs> See, we, we would love, have got to that Roll- had Jamie not hijacked oh, the entire topic. Fuck. See? <laughs> <laughs> I'm ill. Ollie Ollie World is awesome. Blame Go it play it. Go vote for it. <laughs> it's okay, mate. I love you and all of your tangents. That's why we're friends, man. That's why we're I friends. Should, <laughs> I should be allowed to talk. No, <laughs> no. Stay. Talk. Don't, stay. don't be sick. Oh. I know. <laughs> so, ladies and gentlemen, friends, thank you so much for tuning in, listening to episode 86 of the Weekend Catch-Up Club podcast. I think it was another fantastic show. A huge shout out to my co-hosts of Jamie and Sarah. And you can hear Sarah in Goat Simulator 3, which is out now, I believe. But also check out Roller Drum, which I've been playing a little bit of for the past few days. Sarah's trying to do it. I was going to do Wow. <laughs> wow. <laughs> <laughs> the own That's going to be wild. worth buying it for that. <laughs> I'm sure it has to. <laughs> Imagine if they just they just sent that to me. They were like, Sarah, just do this. It's this really weird, specific thing we want you to do. Wow. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> and that's a wrap, everybody. We'll see you next week. Bye-bye. Bye.